Thank you so much, Patty and David, for getting us started here this morning in our worship. Um, as we begin this time of worship, I once again want to extend my gratitude to Avon Congregational Church for uh, inviting West Avon to come on over here and join together once again in its long history of shared worship. Uh, my name is Brian Hardy. I'm the pastor at West Avon Congregational Church, and it's a, it's a privilege to be able to be with you here in the month of August and to give Pastor Chris a, a well-deserved time of, of a restoration uh, during these mo this month. There are a number of events that are in the works right now for both congregations, and uh, it is very helpful if you would uh, look in the bulletins and see the different announcements and activities so that you can make sure nothing kind of sneaks up on you. Uh, I, I, I don't like to read all of them, but I do want to highlight just a few just to make sure they're in our consciousness. Uh, one of them, last week we talked a bit about how Gifts of Love, uh, which is always up to something pretty wonderful, uh, right now as they prepare for the school year, has the additional uh, task underway of trying to get those supplies together uh, to share with some of those families that they help with food through the year and give other assistance to. Um, so uh, you could be a help in doing that. Uh, and, and one of the ways to do that is to, if you have some of those supplies or you're going to be getting some, get a little extra. Uh, there's the opportunity to drop them off here at Avon Congregational Church, also at West Avon uh, Congregational. Uh, there's a drop off right outside the office. And also you can drop them off at Gifts of Love. There's details here about the, the way to do that right now. Um, so want to put that in your awareness. And that's the perfect kind of thing to share with others. Uh, to put out there, this is an agency that helps everybody, uh, and so uh, we can all support them and, and help to make their work a little bit easier. In addition, I want to call your attention to the fact that while there are some things still happening here uh, in this month, including Stone Soup coming up here at Avon Congregational Church and continuing Bible studies and bereavement groups and different pieces like that, once we get to September, we all know there's some really wonderful things that happen as we kind of jump into gear in our congregations. And so there's lots of details here, and you should definitely read through them. But I would just point out that uh, after we get past Labor Day, uh, at West Avon Congregational on, on the 12th, we'll have our rally day, which is traditionally outside and with some special music and food and activities and, and, and a kind of a kickoff. The Saturday after that is the fall festival again over at West Avon, and uh, we're, we're looking always for folks to participate in that to help to share their goods. We're looking for bakers to go ahead and to, to share uh, what they're able to create. Uh, and then the very next day on Sunday, September 19th, uh, there's an all-church picnic for Avon Congregational Church, and we want to make sure that that's on your calendars so that you can be ready to go ahead and, and get together with folks and, and kick off the year. And then right after that, uh, the 23rd through the 25th, here again at Avon Congregational, there's the annual rummage sale. And uh, that's always something that folks are wanting to get in and see what's there, but also, of course, donate, have the items to go ahead and to, to share with others. So, I've given you a lot, and you probably didn't catch all of those dates. Guess what? It's written in your bulletin, so you're, you're good to go. And, and if also, of course, wonderful to receive the email updates uh, from the churches so that you keep up to date with these developments. Um, and also as we kind of update you as we continue to move forward, uh, finding our way through with worship and, and, and the best way to do things right now. Are there other announcements or news that we want to highlight this morning as we get started? Anything else uh, to, to make sure we bring to folks' attention? Yes, Brenda. Absolutely. Um, I can tell you they were excellent last week, and you should definitely get on over there. There's a wide variety and some wonderful company. So uh, uh, if that's something you have some time for afterwards, I know it's depending on how long I talk. I'll do my best. But if you have some time afterwards, uh, please do make your way over either way outside or down the hallway and, and join in for that. Other announcements, other news we want to highlight this morning? Anything else? Yes. Okay, so Patty would be happy to talk to folks about that, provide details, or I'd love to hear about leads. That's wonderful. Uh, anything else this morning, folks? Okay. If not, then what I want to do is invite you, if you feel comfortable doing so, uh, to please rise. And once you've done so, we're going to continue kind of our, our modified greeting to each other here. And that is, rise right where you are, 
And then uh, we're going to go ahead and wave to each other and, and say hello and, and air high fives, whatever you want to do. So get on up. Everybody's waiting for the first person to do it. I'm already standing. So, uh, and, and just say hello to everybody, okay? Say good morning to folks. I'm going to say good morning to the folks who are watching us online, too. Uh, we got folks all over the place. So I know there's different ways we can do this, but this is one way to get things started this morning, and we want to make sure we have that opportunity. And since I've got you standing now, haha, you can look in your bulletins and you will find our call to worship. And if you're comfortable remaining standing, please do so, and we'll share this as we get started. Out of the depths I cry to you, O God. We hunger for the bread of life, O Jesus, and we thirst for you, O God. O God, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. We hunger for the bread of life, O Jesus, and we thirst for you, O God. There is forgiveness with you, and I wait for you, O God. My soul waits for you. We hunger for the bread of life, O Jesus, and we thirst for you, O God. In your words, I hope. My soul waits for you, God, more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. We hunger for the bread of life, O Jesus, and we thirst for you, O God. Amen. Again, if you're still comfortable, please stay, remain standing, but grab the Faith We Sing, the smaller of the two hymnals that you have there, and uh, you're going to go to number 200, 200, uh, 2,236, 2236, I can say it, uh, and we're going to sing uh, Gather Us In as we get started. <laughs> Fears and our dreamings 
Thank you very much. If you'd all be seated, we'll take a moment to invite the Holy Spirit to be a part of our worship, no matter whether we're here or in a distant place, a different time. And we'll ask that God will help to bind us together because we know that we are connected as God's family here on earth. So please join your heart with mine. God, as we come here today, we are grateful for the opportunity to worship you. We're grateful for these church families. We're grateful for this space and its history and the way that it helps us to be reminded of your sacred presence and the beauty that you bring to our lives and to this world. As we worship you, no matter where we are, we ask that you would send your spirit, that you would help us to feel that we are not alone, that we are connected to each other and that we are connected to you. And God, we ask that you would bless us. Bless us with inspiration and strength and wisdom and guidance. We pray for all of these gifts, even as right now we join in sharing aloud the prayer our Savior taught us. <laughs> Excuse me. If you would. <laughs> One second. Oops, I'm sorry. <clears throat> if you would. <clears throat> our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Thank you for taking that up, folks. I'm sorry. <laughs> now I'd like to ask that we would continue in prayer. And one of the things we recognize as we come together, and <clears throat> one of the things we're going to hear in Scripture today, is that there are things that we in our lives strive to do, that we try to find ways to act as Christians, that we find ways to act as human beings that fully use all of our gifts and our potential that find ways to support each other and to build each other up. And even though we have so many things that we can do and so many things that we've learned, we still fall short too often. We can carry the guilt and the hurt and the wounds from that, and that can hold us back. Or we can reach out to God and we can ask for healing and forgiveness and grace and mercy. And freed, we can move forward trying to do even more of what God has given us. So if you would, join with me and let's share this prayer of confession together. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change, Open to us a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Jesus is indeed the light of the world. Jesus helps to guide our steps forward to show us what is possible, to show us a life lived in love and justice and mercy and bids us to come and to follow. So now, having laid down these burdens of regret and hindsight and living in the past that cannot be changed, let's move forward, realizing that we have before us so much more that we can do with this time, so much good we can do, so much love we can share. And let us take hold of that opportunity and rejoice in the chance to do it. Amen. Morning. Good morning. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 25. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, 
for which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and the sacrifice of God. Our second reading uh, this morning comes from the Gospel according to John chapter 6, beginning with verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they say, all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. May God bless the words and hearing of this scripture that we say this morning. Let us rise and bless him for these words. so much. Please be seated if you would. Okay. I need to know something this morning. Um, And so I know it's tough when you ask questions in sermons. People are like, don't ask questions in sermons. Don't put us on the spot. You're on the spot up there. But I need to know something so I can see if I can proceed. Can you all keep a secret? You'd be honest with me, right? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody online, I'm hoping, and this, of course, will sit there in perpetuity online. So everybody who ever watches this, you think, I'm not sure. Maybe they can't. We'll, we'll see. I'm going to take a chance on this. We'll see how this goes. We'll see how many people come back and repeat this to me. Um, I'm going to share something with you. Uh, it's right up there in the top, most embarrassing moments of my life. And I'm going to share it with you in confidence and trust that we are a, a loving community that can hold this in this space and online and for everybody who watches it for years and years to come. So we'll see how this goes. Um, Oh, go, yeah, see. (laughs) It'll never be traced back to you. There we go, okay. Okay, This the good news is it wasn't that long ago so I can actually remember it. Um, It was just Friday. Uh, Friday was a day, there was lots going on. Uh, As the day went on, late in the afternoon, uh, one of my daughters and I had eye appointments and we went uh, to go get checked out, a good thing to do every year. Uh, I, I, I went prepared. I knew it was going to happen. He dilated my eyes, um, you know, so then I'm like an owl, you know. I had my sunglasses, though, and I'm wondering how in the world it's safe to drive this way, but that's fine, and I, 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 I go home, and then uh, I needed to make a, another run, and that was to head over to the veterinary clinic that we use. We have a couple of dogs that are going through some things right now, and uh, I threw two of the dogs in the car with me and, uh, and figured I'd economize, do things together. 
ran over, did my errand, and things are going well, I'm getting everything done, I'm driving home, and then I realize I mean, I'm hitting the jackpot at this point because as I'm making my way back towards my house, I'm driving alongside McLean Game Refuge, and, uh, and there's a little side entrance. There's always like four cars parked there, or giant mud puddles or whatever. I, I never go in that entrance. And there's nobody there. There's no cars, there's no nothing. And I, I'm just like, you know, it's one, of those, it's one of those fantastic moments in life where you just feel like, I need to buy a lottery ticket right now. You know, this is great. So I, I, I pull over, you know, and uh, I have plenty of space, and I get out of the car, and I, I'm walking around with my sunglasses on. I thought about wearing my sunglasses today for anonymity in doing this, um, but I've been told I kind of look like one of the, the motorcycle cops and chips when I wear them, so uh, I can't take all the harassment from everything. I, I got to limit it today. But I'm walking around, you know, my sunglasses on, I'm doing, doing things with my dogs and picking up and, you know, getting back to the car and hey, this is just golden. And I'm going to make it home, I'm going to take the other dog out, I'm going to make dinner and, you know, this is, this is great. And I, uh, I get the car started and I turn around, I look over my shoulder and I, and I, and I go ahead to pull out onto the road and uh, I kind of go up in the air and then I come back down pretty hard and, uh, and I, that's when I stop. Uh, and... Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I have some brains. Also, I couldn't go any further. Uh, so I got out of the car, and I go around and look. My front end is, like, into the road. Made it that far. And I have driven up and over a tree stump. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, which takes some doing, honestly. I mean, you know, I just want to throw that out there. Uh, you know, if anybody's looking for recommendations, uh, your car made it over. I mean, you know, you got up. That's pretty great. So, uh but it made it over and it plopped right down. Uh, so now the tree stump was kind of like a big car jack under one side of my car. And uh, you know, it, it's in the air. Um, cars are just, you know, going by. You're getting out of work. Everybody's just kind of driving by. I'm, I'm sitting there with my hazards on and uh, I'm on full display for everybody. Um, it's just an amazing feeling. And, uh, so I, you know, I try what I can do, nothing's working, and, I, and I, I resort to, you know, calling for help, which I'm sorry, and toxic, toxic masculinity, that's just not an okay thing, you know, you just want to be able to solve it and not tell anybody that you goofed up, nobody needs to know, but I have to tell somebody. So I, I call AAA, and uh, well, I try the app, and I do all the stuff, and I get to the end, and it says, uh, this isn't working, the app tells me, and it says, I got a call, all right, fine, that was great, that was very helpful. So I call, I do all the stuff, I'm on hold, I'm waiting, and then the music just stops. Phone's still on, every line's still up, but the music stops. I sit for a while wondering, what am I supposed to do? <sighs> Call them again, go through the whole process, 16 digit numbers, everything, figuring out where I am. Thank God for modern technology. And uh, I get to the end of it and they say, okay, so the way it's looking, maybe two hours, maybe more, uh, before somebody's going to get over there. Okay, I mean, cars going past me, you know, left and right. Other people now arriving to use the spot like I've always seen my whole life. Uh, and what a spectacle. Uh, I'm on the phone with AAA, in fact, and somebody pulls up in front of me and then gets out of the car and slowly walks over, and I'm talking on the speaker. They can hear me like you do when people talk on the cars. And the dogs are freaking out, and there's a guy who's like standing outside my window, and he's just laughing. He's just laughing as he looks in the window. He, you know, he thinks it's hilarious, and I'm, I'm really appreciating the support you know, at, the, at that moment. Um, yeah, so I'm sitting there on my stump with my dogs, um, and, and, you know, I, I begin to tell people what's happened. Some of my friends I was, were expecting to hear from me later that evening, different parts of the country. I let them know, and they become, they become the friends from the book of Job. Now I'm testing your biblical knowledge, okay? And no, I'm not equating getting on a stump to what happened to Job. I'm not doing that, all right? I'm not doing that. But if you get into the middle part of Job, and that's never the part we read in church. We always read the beginning and the end. If you read the middle part, there's this whole stretch where after every horrible thing in the world has happened to Job, and he's lost everything and his family and all of it, and he's sitting there and grieving, his friends come over to sit and grieve with him, to sit Shiva, to do that with him. And it's, that's a wonderful expression you know, to, of, of connection to do that, but the problem is they sit there and instead of just being a supporting presence, they spend the next I don't know how many chapters asking him lots of questions and trying to figure out what he did wrong to deserve all this. Now, my friends didn't do that to me, but they gave me every sort of unhelpful help about what I was supposed to do about getting my car off of this stump and uh, what they would do. And, you know, I, 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 they're, they're obviously great mountaineers, uh, but, I, you know, it just, I didn't need to do extra damage. Uh, it was okay. I had a good Samaritan stop. This gives you hope and humanity. 
Somebody was taking her teenage daughter to get ice cream, stopped, you know, was trying to help, and, and I really doubted it was going to work, but, but really wanted to help. And so went back to the house, brought some things to put under one of the tires, see if we could make it work. Uh, we tried. It did not work. Uh, I was so grateful for the time they took. Uh, it was very nice of them. I tried to pay for the ice cream. They wouldn't let me. They said, just if somebody else needs help, just do it for them. And, uh, you know, that was pretty great. And I got back in the car and I waited. And the cars went by, and everybody's looking, and everybody's looking, and everybody's looking. And finally, I mean, not after an unreasonable amount of time, but more than two hours, here comes the truck, and lickety split, I'm off the stump. And uh, I get to go ahead and lick my wounds and go home and do all the other things that needed to happen that day. When I was telling some other friends about what happened, one of them, after they you know, got the story, asked me, you know, was I calm or was I angry uh, when all this was going on? It's a good question, right? Uh, car difficulties are right up there on the top of the list that usually brings out wonderful, colorful language and anger that we might not do any other time. Computers is also, you know, technology, cars, same thing. There were lots of moments, I mean, that I could have been, you know, pretty frustrated or angry or bitter, uh, you know, when it happened, um, when the guy was laughing at me in my window. Uh, when I sat there and had car after car go by, and, I, and I'm projecting, but I'm thinking about what they're thinking as they see the, the guy who put his car up on, on a stump over there. Um, my friends and their wonderful suggestions that weren't helping and were just frustrating at the time. Uh, there were so many pieces, so many things in this that just could have you know, been that. The, the calls, trying to get a hold of help, and then how long it took. And there's so many pieces in there that were justifiable moments to be angry. Um, and I'm not trying to say I'm anything great, but I, that's not where I went. But I could picture going there. I, mean, I could picture that there's a lot of reasons, any one of which could have been a great reason just to lose it, to just let it all out, to, to feel all those feelings and kind of be there. Now, maybe it would be different if it wasn't the dogs in the back and their, un, un, you know, their, their love that will never budge. If it was a small child in the car with me, maybe that would temper things a bit. If I was sitting there wearing my clerical collar, or I had a church bumper sticker on, or I was wearing one of the Be the Church cool t-shirts I saw someone wearing the other day, maybe that would click into place, and I would sit there and say, okay, maybe I shouldn't do any of those things, and I should just sit here like a good person and, 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 and deal with life's challenges. There were a lot of reasons to go ahead and to lose it. There always are in life. And yet, we have an admonition in our scripture today in Ephesians, one I was just very much aware of getting ready for this Sunday. And we have the author of Ephesians, most likely Paul, sitting there and talking to folks and saying there are things in our lives that we need to go ahead and get rid of. We need to not act out about. So bitterness, wrath, anger, wrangling, slander, malice. I don't know about you, but in the recent years we've been living through, it feels like there's plenty of that to go around. Sometimes couched as humor, but still, the way that we talk about each other or to each other, the way that we interact, the way that we think about whole groups of folks, uh, it seems like there's plenty of bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander and malice going around as it is. It means that we need to pay attention, I think. It means that this scripture passage that's dating back so many hundreds of years, that it still speaks just as much to us today as it did then, when they didn't have all the technology and they didn't do fool things like run their cars up on stumps for no good reason whatsoever in front of everybody in the world. Even though they don't have those moments, even though they probably had different groups that they disagreed with and warred with and thought poorly of, we know they did, they have the same kinds of issues about how they react that we have today. Now, we could sit here and say, these sound wonderful, uh, you know, to go ahead and, and just kind of get all this stuff under control, and we can go ahead and do that, and, that, and the world will be a better place, and, uh, and, and, but it's kind of hard to do it, because how do you do it? I mean, there are just moments it gets away from us, or there are moments when it feels like there's nothing else you can do, and if you don't let it out, you're going to explode. You may feel differently afterwards, but uh, there's just these pieces to who we are as human beings. And, you know, so if we, if we can't, 
If we can't do it all the time, there can be a struggle with saying, should we be really trying hard at all? We can look at Paul as an example if we really are wrestling with that kind of a question. Paul, in his writings, often talked about his shortcomings. Now, it sounded like humble brags to me a lot of times. He'd talk about all this, what's wrong, what's wrong, and then he'd talk about the good stuff he was doing. Eh. But he did talk about what's wrong, the things that were wrong with him, the struggles that he had. And yet, when he was writing, he said he was striving toward perfection. And by doing that, he said he was energizing, he was being enabled, and he was in the beautiful, in, in, in Philippians 3.14, he said, I'm going to press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm going to keep trying, basically. Even though I'm not perfect, even though I may not be able to do all of it. We know we're human. We know this is asking a lot to kind of totally modify our lives. And we may say to ourselves, I know lots of people who are way worse about all of these things. I'm okay. I mean, it's there, but like, I'm okay. There's lots of people that really need to hear this, and I'm maybe not the one. But before we kind of totally let ourselves off and look for something else from Scripture that is supposed to speak to us, we should pay attention, because chances are there's something here for everyone. Now, we can war, like I said, with can we do it perfectly? No, we cannot do it perfectly. And I happen to be one of those people that struggles with that reality. And for instance, you've seen me over the many years here that I have a lifelong issue with weight and up and down and left and right and exercise and diet and, and, and you know, boredom and feelings and all kinds of good stuff. And in the midst of that, whenever I go ahead and I'm trying really hard and then I have a moment where I do not do what I intended to do, there's a real temptation to say, well, I blew it. So I guess I don't have to keep trying. And then just go back. And sometimes you have to bite the bullet. And even if you blew it, say it was still worth trying before that, so why isn't it worth trying now? And accepting that you're human. In truth, this is good advice for everybody in the world. You know, going ahead and taking these things in our lives and getting them under control but if we are people of faith and we want to say that our faith has an effect on who we are in this world, then there's really a call for us to be active in doing that. Harry Emerson Fosdick, uh, who was a very influential minister, uh, at the height of his influence, he was pastor at Riverside Church in New York City. He was a speaker in so many places, and at one point he was making a tour of Palestine and other, other areas in the Near and Middle East, and he was invited to the American University of Beirut in, in Lebanon. And he spoke to the student body, and there were people from all different countries, and, and there were 16 different religions uh, that were represented in the student body and in the faculty. And uh, he, he really warred about what could he say that would be relevant to a, a group that was that varied in terms of where they were and what they believed and what their background was. And this is how he began when he spoke to them. He said, I do not ask anyone here to change their religion, but I do ask all of you to face up to the question, what is your religion doing to your character? There have been plenty of wise folks from different traditions that have gone at this from different directions and given advice or said this is what we should be doing. The Dalai Lama said, be kind whenever possible, and it is always possible to be kind. Emerson, in his wonderful writing, said, what you are speaks so loudly I cannot hear a word that you say. Excuse me. Yeah. And Abraham Joshua Heschel said, When I was young, I admired clever people. Now that I am old, I admire kind people. Different traditions, different backgrounds, and yet talking about this character, this, this way that people live and, and how it affects. It affects, obviously, you heard about admiration there. It affects how we think about people in our lives I'm a hospice chaplain. It's another hat that I wear. I help out with one of the funeral homes in town in terms of when families need help with services for loved ones. I do that. Uh, so I'm around a lot of different times where we are, are at the end of someone's life or we're giving thanks for someone's life. And I can tell you that while obituaries are a wonderful place to kind of say all the different accomplishments and the things that the person has done during their lifetime, when it comes to gathering, yeah, and that's something that's been hard to do, I know. But when it comes to gathering and reflecting on the life that has been lived and the difference it has made, more often than not, that's not what we're talking about in those gatherings. What we are talking about is the person themselves. 
And when folks speak about admiration and respect for that person, they're generally talking about how that person lived their life, how they treated the people around them, and how they practiced love to different people in different ways. It matters in what we think. In that letter to the Ephesians, it continues. It says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly beloved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. So we turn away from the things we shouldn't do, and then we get some of the things that we should be doing. It didn't just start in Ephesians, of course. It didn't just start with a thought about what it is to be a good person in life. For folks who are writing in this time and writing to these churches, they have a very good foundation to be basing it on. Jesus, in his ministry, made an essential mark of authentic, authentic discipleship. Jesus said, this is how people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Not if you believe all the right things. He didn't say that. Not if you pray a lot. Not if you tithe of your income. Not if you worship in the correct way. Those are all you know, great things to strive to do. But when Jesus said, what is the most important thing that I'm looking for from those who would follow me? According to him, the way we show that we belong to him is that we love one another and that we act out of our love by being kind to one another. Well... Let's say that we're managing that. Let's say that we are really keeping things. We don't get mad. We don't get riled. We don't say bad things about people. We, 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 you know, we keep it all under check. No malice. No kind of underneath stuff that we're doing in our life. We're not cheating. We got it all under control. That's, we've already reached a high goal if you're doing that. Is that enough by itself? I don't think so. There's a little girl who said a prayer one time, a perfect prayer. She said, God, make the bad people good and make the good people nice. Think about Jesus and the Pharisees around him who were trying so faithfully to do what their faith instructed them to do, to make sure that they stayed away from the things they were commanded to stay away from and doing the things they were commanded to do. They were focusing on it, and yet Jesus would take them to task and talk about, and where is your focus in the midst of all of this on your love for the needs of the people right here? And if those rules are more important to you than doing that, then there is a, a problem that has come about. It's not enough just to go ahead and try to get these things technically right. We have to find ways to do it in a way that lives out the love and the care and the concern that Jesus showed to us. I'm going to show just two more stories. I'm going to share two stories to kind of close out this time. They are not about me. Ew. All right, all right. And I'm hoping I've talked so long now you've already forgotten my embarrassing things so that you won't have a temptation to share it with anybody else. You're actually welcome to share it with everybody. You're fine. I'll probably post a picture on social media now that I've uh, div divulged it in, uh, in public. One thing I want to share you may already be aware of, but my gosh, it struck a chord. Olympics have come to a conclusion. It's all wrapping up right now. Lots of different stories, lots of different things. I didn't follow a lot of it, honestly, this year and just in life. Um, but one thing I did a week ago, today actually, um, there was that amazing story about the high jump for men. And I don't know how many people followed any of this, but there were two athletes that came down to, in the end, competing for the gold medal. There was one, Timberi of Italy, and another, Barshem of Qatar. And uh, they went, and they both flawlessly made it over 2.37 meters. I know you know all exactly how tall that is. It's uh, 7 feet 9 and a quarter inches. I know you did the math. So then they had to try 2.39 meters. They both tried three times. They did not make it, either of them. So with the rules, what you normally most often do is you'd have a jump off at that point until somebody couldn't make one, and then the other one would be the winner if they could. But there was another possibility, another thing in the rules. And NBC, while they were covering it, while the commentators are talking in between things, they're saying, you know, there's, they can do that, or there's another option, and they could share. And they haven't, they haven't even gotten through describing it. And there, Barshem goes to the officials and says, can we have two golds? And before the official can finish the whole explanation of it, Barshem reaches out to Timberi and they shake hands and they start celebrating. Timberi really starts celebrating. The crowd is cheering. And these two folks who become friends as they have competed for more than a decade, 
both were able to go ahead and recognize their achievements that day and the excellence that they had pursued, and both could do it in a way that felt satisfying to them and felt like it reflected who they were and how they felt. It was pretty amazing. I think I saw something that said it hadn't happened in more than 100 years in the Olympics. I'm not positive. I, I don't swear, but I, I, think I, saw, I think I saw that. And it's not the be-all, end-all, and maybe you don't have exactly those kind of situations in your life, but man, it's uplifting when you find someone who is acting from a different place than all those other qualities we're being told to stay away from. The last story I want to share with you is to recognize that that's an Olympic moment, and most of us, our Olympic possibilities are probably passed us by at this point. Mine a long time ago, like when I was three. Um, but there are moments in our regular living where we make crucial choices, and they can make a big difference. There's someone named James McCormick, and he wrote, and he said, 20 years ago, I drove a cab for a living. It was a cowboy's life, a life for someone who wanted no boss. What I didn't realize was that it was also a ministry. This is because he drove a night shift, and his cab became a moving confessional. People would get in. It was an anonymity. They'd talk about what was going on in their lives, their frustrations. They, they, they'd use that moment, and they, they, they'd talk about all sorts of things, and it was pretty amazing. He said that was fine. He just got used to it, and none of it really touched him until one late August night. He arrived to a call at 2.30 in the morning and to a building that was dark except for a single light on a ground floor window, and he knew that a lot of drivers, if they showed up like that, they'd honk once or twice, they'd wait a minute, and if nothing immediately happened, they'd just drive away. You know, uh, nobody's right there standing there. It's the middle of the night. You know, what are they, they don't want to deal with it. Too many unknowns. But he had seen too many people who didn't have a lot of other means to get around in dealing with life that that been stranded in just that way. So unless it felt dangerous, you know, he always tried to see what he could do. So he went and made his way into the building. He knocked on the door for the person that he was supposed to get, and he heard a voice say, just a minute. And when the person opened the door, um, he looked, and there was a small woman. She was in her 80s. Uh, she had a print dress and a pillbox hat and a veil pinned on it, and she looked like somebody straight out of a 1940s movie. And she had a small nylon suitcase, and looking behind her, it looked like the apartment was bare. It was like no one had lived there in years. The furniture was covered in sheets. There was no clock on the wall, no, you know, nothing laying about. She asked him if he'd carry her bag to the car, and he took it out there, and um, she kept thanking him over and over for her kind, his kindness. He said, oh, it's nothing, and he just tried to treat people like his mother would want them to treat them. And uh, so then as they get in the car, and, and she gets the address to him, uh, she says, well, could you drive through downtown? He said, well, it's not the shortest way. And she said, I don't mind. I'm, I'm not in a hurry. I'm on my way to hospice. So he looked in the rearview mirror, and uh, she told him that she was basically alone at this point, and uh, the doctor said there wasn't that much longer. And so he turned over, and he, he shut the meter off, and he asked her exactly what she wanted to see. So for two hours, they drove through the city, and uh, she would tell him that that was the building where she worked as an elevator operator, and that was the neighborhood where she and her husband had lived when they were newlyweds. And they pulled up in front of a, a furniture warehouse that she said had once been a ballroom when she went dancing when she was young. And uh, you know they'd show, and, and they'd stop, and they'd sit and look at some of those things. And then as the sun started to come up that morning, she said she was tired, and it was time to go now. So they drove over to the address of a convalescence home. And uh, he drove under the portico, portico, and the orderlies came out. They looked like they had been expecting her. And they helped her in. They were very nice and watching her every move. And uh, when she was already seated in the wheelchair they had brought out, she asked how much she owed. And he said, well, nothing. And she said, well, you have to make a, you have to make a living. And he said, well, there, there are other passengers. And so he didn't even think about it. He just, in reflex, bent over and he gave her a hug. He says, he held on tightly for a second. And she said to him, you gave an old woman a little moment of joy. Thank you. He said he squeezed her hand, and then he went ahead and made his way as she went into the building. He said it was the sound of the closing of a life. He didn't pick up anybody else that day. He drove around just lost in thought for the rest of the day. And he thought to himself, what if that woman had received some an angry driver who was fed up because she wasn't there waiting at the step and just honked and took off? Or what if she had received somebody who didn't really want a small talk and was impatient and just wanted to get her where she was going and, and be done with it? 
What if he had refused to take that run? Or what if he'd just kind of done the bare minimum in that moment? And he did a quick review, and he says, I don't think I've ever done anything more important in my life. So I wonder if that's what it's about. At the end of the day, is it about kindness for God's and then ours? Remember these words, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Amen.
we have lots of different ways that we give and offer our talents. And, and uh, I'm, I'm very conscious of the host of folks from Avon Congregational who helped to organize the service and present this wonderful time for us and the food that awaits us and, and gets us online. I'm very grateful for the music today uh, from folks from both churches. I'm, I'm grateful for uh, folks standing up and sharing scripture with us. Um, there's just so many things just in this moment in terms of what people are offering. And we know there's lots of moments. So we give thanks for those opportunities to give. We also are mindful that there's lots of ways to do that, whether we take some of our possessions and share them with those in need, like through the gifts of love offering, whether we take some of the resources, the money that we have, and we pool it together so that as communities of faith, we can provide times to share the good news and then act upon it. Um, and we can do that through the boxes in the back or through online or mailing them into the church or however. There's so many ways that we're giving uh, that we need to ask God's blessing on those efforts. So I want to ask if you would join with me, please rise, and let's share our doxology as a way of asking a blessing in this moment. Please be seated if you would, folks. Are there joys or concerns, prayers that we want to make sure we share as a community this morning as a part of this worship? Is there anything in particular that folks want to make sure we include? I have some to share, so, uh, and I know you have some in your heart, undoubtedly, that you can share with God now and at other times. Let's go to God in prayer then as the people of God and share what we have there within our hearts. God, we give you thanks as we here in our little corner of the world have been able to watch people come together from all throughout the world and to be able to find ways to strive for excellence, to show how they have used your gifts and talents to try to excel at things that bring inspiration and hope and amazement to the world and to be able to do this peacefully, to find ways just to strive, to strive to be their best and to respond to the efforts of others. God, help us to learn from this example, even as we have the example set for us in the teachings today in Scripture about how we can learn from you and live a life in keeping with your wishes. God, within our hearts, there are prayers that we lift to you each day for ourselves and for others. Today, we want to lift prayers for um, Dorothy Floyd, now living in Florida, who uh, on the 12th of this month is going to be turning 100, and that's a, a wonderful milestone, and so we want to lift up prayers of thanksgiving for her life. We also want to offer prayers for those who find themselves in times where they're seeking healing. And last week we heard about Mona and offered prayers for Mona. Well, and the, the news is back that she had her leg amputation and it went well and that she's forging ahead with extensive PT and doing it with gusto right now. And so we give thanks for the help so far for Mona and we ask continued prayers for her. Also, we have within our hearts the memories and thoughts about those who have gone before us. And just yesterday, Mike Alessio's mom, Rose, passed away after uh, a battle with cancer. And so we offer prayers for that family and for her loved ones as they give thanks for her life right now. Folks, here, we, we ask that you would hear the prayers of everybody here and their hearts. And God, we ask that you would search us and that you would respond in your wisdom and mercy, blessing us, helping us in turn to be a blessing to others, and finding ways that we can continue to build up your kingdom here on earth. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. So we're going to sing our closing hymn now. And again, it's in the Faith We Sing, this uh, smaller book, number 2171, 2171. And it's an adaptation of the prayer of St. Francis, which felt appropriate as we thought about the qualities we should be seeking today. If you're comfortable doing so, please rise and join with Sing, sing With Me. <laughs>
Thank you very much, folks. Thanks for singing these words and thinking about this prayer. Uh, before I give the benediction, just a reminder, right next door, uh, there are some wonderful treasures waiting for you. Uh, and that, are, that, that includes people over there, but also some food and beverages. So uh, we hope that you'll join us next door after the service. But let's have this final, final moment of blessing for our worship this morning. God, as we go into the world, help us to continue to be of service. Service to you, service to those that we meet along our journey, finding ways to use our gifts and our talents and our abilities fruitfully, finding ways in our lives to live so that others, when they encounter us, will know from who we are and how we act that we follow someone who has taught us love, who has taught us caring and kindness and mercy and a search and a hunger for justice. We pray all these things trusting in your peace to make them possible. Amen.